Okay, sorry everyone, I thought we might make a start. We're a little bit, a little bit late starting off this morning. Um, thank you all for joining us for our um, <laughs> present, panel presentation on adaptive management from theory to practice. Um, I know that all the bios are listed up on the website, but I wanted to just go through our eminent panel and uh, just give you a quick highlight of who we've got here with us today, um, who'll be sharing their thoughts and perspectives on their experiences and working in adaptive management programs. Um, so we have uh, a very esteemed thinker from the Thinking, Working, Political, Politically um, School of Thought, uh, or if that's what we call it, or the New Orthodoxy, however you'd like to describe it, um, Graham Teskey, who is the Principal Technical Lead on Governance at Abd Associates and has a long track record working in development um, for the DFAT, World Bank, and what is wrong with my microphone? Like, I imagine dogs here like that. <laughs> um, and he, before that, worked for the Department for International Development in the UK, um, across the world. So I asked everyone to send me fun facts about themselves to liven this up. Uh, Graham wrote back and said there was absolutely nothing fun or interesting about him, and that he was middle England, middle class, and middle everything. <laughs> so I, I think we can agree that, especially that last point, is far from the truth, and many of us are here to hear his interesting, very yeah, insightful opinions and experiences on this topic. We also have now our Ben French, who's the public sector um, governance portfolio lead at Oxford Policy Management and a work colleague of mine. He joins us here from the UK. Um, ben has worn different hats as well. He also has worked on the donor side of things, worked for the Department for International Development in Pakistan before, and before that was an ODI fellow in South Sudan. Um, he also has a fun fact that he has set up ultimate Frisbee teams in many of the countries he's lived in, including South Sudan and Pakistan, um, which is a great way, I think, to yeah, get to know people. We have um, Nicola Follis joining us here, who is the partner um, in, for the Asia-Pacific region for Palladium. Um, before that, uh, Nicola headed up Palladium's governance practice in the UK, and she's worked in many areas, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and the Caribbean, and the Balkans, but has recently now just moved to Brisbane and calls Australia home and is fresh off the boat. <laughs> so welcome, Nicola. And last but not least, we have Saku Akmimana, who's the pr principal specialist of governance um, at DFAT, who's here. Uh, Saku did warn, warn me that she's not a morning person, but that's, that's all right, she's here on time, that's great. Um, and Saku you know, leads the thinking on this you know, political economy analysis and this way of working um, within, within DFAT. Um, and before that, she worked at the UN and the World Bank, primarily in South and East Asia. Uh, fun fact about Saku is that despite the fact that she's worked in refugee camps in mozzie domes with no water, she would explain her greatest challenge to date is moving to Canberra and having to drop her 13-year-old daughter off to the Gungahlin Aquatic Centre on a Friday evening, <laughs> followed by early morning start at 6am at the lake for dragon boating. So yeah, that's, um, that's our panel that we have here today. So our structure today, we're not giving presentations, we're having more of a Davos-style conversation. And just to impose some structure, because I felt uneasy about just an hour and a half of talking, which is what it actually will be, we're just going to split it up into three main sections. Um, and so there'll be about 20 minutes panel conversation, followed by 10 minutes Q&A for each of those sessions. Um, so it'll be a bit more interactive, I think. Um, so yeah, so, just, so today we're all here to talk about you know, the, how we can find ways to implement flexible programming within the context of a more increasingly results-driven agenda. And we're trying to figure out how we can potentially overcome the challenge of adaptive management to have the capacity and the authority to both respond and adapt to things that are happening on the ground as we start implementing. Um, and so to talk about some of the three key challenges that we will be discussing today will be um, one, this issue about failing fast and learning quickly and adaptation. The second one, we'll be looking at the challenges to getting the team right for adaptive management and the people who can work in this way the most effectively. And thirdly, we will be discussing um, building partnerships of trust between implementers and governments and, and where you're working, <coughs> the context in which you're working. So first of all, we're going to start off with failing fast and learning quickly, um, which is one of the key challenges is how to build learning and reflection and adaptation into this way of working. And to start us off on that topic, I'll invite um, Graham to kick us off. Thank you. Okay, then, thank you very much, Yanni. Good morning, everybody. I know that some of you have, um, up there, 
to his pleasure of listening to me before, but for those of you that haven't, let me just explain why I sound like I do. It's now 17 years since I was working for Tiffid in Kampala, um, what I was identified with, what the doctors told me was advanced, aggressive and, uh, in their words, incurable throat cancer. So they had to take away my vocal cords and put in this little bit of plastic which enables me to talk. So please, I would ask you to bear with me. But if I say anything that you don't quite understand, i.e. you don't hear the words rather than make any sense of what I'm saying, <laughs> um, just ask me to repeat it. I'm used to it by now. OK, thank you, Ali. Let's talk about... Um, I want to focus particularly on the learning aspect of this phrase, learning quickly and failing fast. I want to approach it in a, a slightly unusual way in the sense that for those of you that have worked in the area of public service reform, capacity development over the last 20 years, you will recognise what has now become a sort of a conventional way of assessing the chances of success, and that's looking at all the at three levels, the institutional, the organisational, and the individual. And in public service reform, public service management, capacity building, capacity development, whatever you call it, the general consensus is that external partners are not bad at making progress at the individual level, providing training, providing kids, helping the individual understand their job. Donors aren't bad actually at the organisational level, helping with job evaluation, grading, expansive control, organisational structure, you know, long-term vision, all that sort of stuff. But the real weakness in trying to bring around sustained change in public service management, organisational development, is the institutional, the rules of the game, the incentives that motivate and animate. So that threefold level of analysis, the institutional, the organisational, the individual, is a conventional way of assessing PSR. And as I say, the conventional wisdom is, it's weeks at the institutional level that we're failing. My view on adaptive management, and this is basically from the last two years working on three large multi-sector facilities in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and Timor-Leste, which were designed along PDIA lines. My, my judgment is that the reverse of those conclusions about PSR apply. I think the incentives are there, but it's at the organisational and at the individual level that we fail completely. One of the aspects of my job is to look at documents coming out of TIFID, coming out of TFAT, and even coming out of the World Bank, that are seeking contractors. So I have the pleasure of reading them, and in some cases, helping prepare our proposals. Virtually every one of the documents that I've seen in the last couple of years, they're all demanding a PDIA, adaptive management, thinking and working politically approach. They want the design and the implementation to reflect these ideas. In my discussions with TFAS in Canberra, the people that are responsible for the theology of the organisation, its processes, how progress will be judged, they are all convinced that adaptive management has got an important role to play. They argue that all their internal processes allow adaptation in implementation. So I think the incentives are there the institutions that would encourage contractors, implementers like ourselves, and at the oversight agencies and individuals and organisations like TFAT, they want PDIA adaptive management to work. So the incentives are in place. But in my experience, that's not translated into organisational initiatives or individual competence or capability. 
to learn and actually put Peter I into place. Let me just explain that a bit more. Let's look at the organisational level. The key thing, the one overwhelming, defining feature of adaptive management is that three things are done simultaneously. You implement, you monitor, and you learn. Unless those three things are brought together, then you're never going to have a PDIA, adaptive management approach. So your organisational structure has got to bring together the responsibility for delivering the activity, monitoring it, and learning from it. And even in, I'm not sure I should say this, but even in the programmes where I work, for some reason that I fail to understand, monitoring is linked with evaluation and separated out to a little bunch of people that live at the far end of the corridor. And if you ask your implementers for data, how their programme is going, what's causing success, what's causing failure, they will invariably say, well, that's not my responsibility. The monitoring people do that. And that structure is replicated in our development partners, in TFAT, in DFID, in the bank. The responsibility for monitoring and evaluation, first of all, they're two completely different things. They are lumped together and separated out. So there's a real organisational imbalance in the way we think about structuring our responsibilities to give our adaptive management even the remotest chance of success. So that's at the organisational level. And I think at the individual level, in many ways, it's even more complicated. And this comes on to the second question about, well, it's got implications for the second question about getting the teams right. If you think about what are the skills required if you are going to implement, monitor and learn they are very, very demanding. Sorry, Graeme, I might interrupt you there because we're going to talk about that at length in, in the next section. Can I have but one more minute to well, finish I was point. just going to follow, yeah, I was going to say the, the failing um, thing. What you require that those individuals, they've got to be able to analyse, they've got to be able to understand what's going on. So it's analysis, analytical skills. Then they need to assess what are the implications of what's going on, how do we know what's happening, what the implications are. And finally, they've got to be able to adapt. They've got to reach a judgment about the extent to which they need to change. They are remarkably complex skills, and we expect our programme implementation staff to be able to do that. Thank you. <laughs> and I was just going to ask, have you, do, do people acknowledge their failures, or, or how do you, or any of you, feel that with this adaptation, it means you need to, with this portfolio approach to this way of managing, admit when things aren't going right? I mean, has everyone got experience of where that's happened and chat track has been changed? And I don't know, Saku, do you feel that this is something that has happened in the programs that you've worked on? Or Before I get to that, yeah. I, I think I have something to, to add to what Graham said, and that is this, uh, the whole idea of adaptive management and the PDIA model <laughs> is around learning. Learning is at the centre, experimentation, learning, adaptation. And the whole idea came out of the work that Lance Richard did on capability traps. And it's looking at the process of national development. And in, in, those, in, in those processes, you know, these happen over long periods of time. There's an endogenous feedback loop from the experimentation to the, the adaptation. There's a political system, a, a political and administrative system that responds. And, and we're trying to mimic that somehow in, in a compressed program project cycle with something that is you know, externally imposed. So some of those ideas you know, are going to be very hard to, to, to implement because we don't have that endogeneity of the, of the feedback loop. And the, you know, the, 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 biggest, uh, you know, the biggest development story of our lifetimes, um, the, the, um, China pulling billions out of poverty, at the centre of that is a, a, an extraordinary learning culture within uh, the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party, which uh, basically had thousands of labs of experimentation um, with clear high-level development outcomes 
um, or, you know, at the, at the top um, and, and some accountability structures from the, from the centre. So again, I think we have to have some humility um, and modesty in, in terms of what we can do through a, through a project. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, it, it, so, so all the, I mean, I agree with all the points that, that Graham makes, but you know, I think the best we can really do in term, is to find some clear high level um, objectives and, and, and those should be relatively modest because um, again, you're not gonna have transformative change in a five year, even a, a you know, seven year project what you can do, though, is you can be there when big stuff might happen, when a crisis might happen, when some extraordinary, when, when something shifts, um, an equilibrium shifts, and, and uh, you have an opportunity to do something big. And there you have, you're there, and you have the relationships, and you can act. Mm. So I, I'm just suggesting that, yeah, the project model and our bureaucratic mm. modalities are still, you know, lagging way behind the thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe if I could come in from the angle of, uh, in the, um, back in the, the governance portfolio I managed in the UK, we had about eight programs which were at varying degrees of maturity and were all trialing adaptive management approaches in, in different ways and all faced their own challenges and had different contexts. Um, the sort of granddaddy of them all was the State Accountability and Voice Initiative program in Nigeria, and Helen Derbyshire up there was uh, very involved in that, and a lot of the learning that we had was coming out of some of the experience they had over eight years. And I think one of the things we find, um, I completely agree that um, you know, learning, creating learning forms for program teams is important. I really liked Graham's point about the you know, separation out of um, m and &E and technical and operational. We find that a really key factor was enabling a team to work together as a whole bringing them together, um, and, and often a lot of the challenges are actually operational program management, not just technical, or bringing them all together into forums where they could really thrash out you know, what was emerging from evidence, you know, what this meant for adapting work plans, adapting theories of change, and so on. I think more recently, we've had a couple of programs where we've, we've been looking at the problem of license to fail, which is very complex, actually, in the current environment. You know, in a lot of here in Australia, certainly in the UK, there's political pressure in the external public domain um, we find in some programs, which te they tended to be the smaller ones, which are a little bit under the radar, which have been set up to test, uh, and th these kind of approaches. Um, we've been trying out some things like building into the, um, the results frameworks actual indicators around failing. Actually, it's okay to fail, providing you do it quickly and you learn from that. That's one program we've got that's doing that. That's not possible in, in all, but it was an interesting sort of um, approach. Uh, and I think also really, um, clear delineation of decision-making authority, you know, I'm getting into a topic that we'll come to later, but agreeing with our, our, our donor partners and, and so on. When do we make decisions about when we stop, when we start, when we adapt? How much resources are going into that? You know, we, we've trialed some things around allowing ourselves a little bit of flexibility with smaller up to certain budget ceiling to test to pilot the scope. But beyond that, if we're going to invest in something a bit more, it has to be you know, uh, approved with more in-depth theory of change analysis and so on. So, <laughs> These are all things we're trialing, but yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, a evolving sort of beast, and I very much agree with both of, of what Saku and Graham were saying in that regard. Yeah. So the downside of coming at the end of this sort of conversation is that everyone said all the good things. <laughs> um, I, I think the, the thought that goes through my mind, and, and I've been reading um, quite a bit about growth mindsets recently, uh, and, and so just to sort of change the, the context, but. If you think about it, as t children, we have, we're sort of encouraged to fail. And you're incentivized to fail up to a certain extent. And then we start to change that uh, in our education system and start to say, no, 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 you need to get an A+. Plus. You know, you shouldn't experiment. You should. Um, and we do the same thing with our development programs. You know, I asked all of the sort of OPM teams that are talking about uh, you know, adaptive programming and growth you know, and, and sort of doing these things differently. And it was fascinating that they all came up with different things. But the big challenge always seemed to be, how do we build a growth mindset into our team? How do we build this mindset that says, actually, it's OK to screw up? And it's OK to screw up and then admit that we've screwed up. Because actually, there's a lot of psychology that says, well, as human adults, we do not like to admit that we've made a complete and utter mess of something. Um, and we have a really difficult time accepting that. So, 
you know, failing fast and accepting that uh, we then need to learn quickly is a great concept, but it's actually something that we're hardwired not to do. And then on top of that, when we started thinking about this thinking working politically, we actually hire people and we say, please invest your political capital, your social networks, in making a project work. Oh, and, and by the way, in five years, it might not be around and you'll be completely screwed over uh, because it didn't work. So how do, you, how do we manage that process, right? They have a massive incentive not to fail, to minimize their risk, minimize their exposure. At the same time, we, we know that actually if we're not encouraging failure, we're not going to find the, the solutions that actually enable uh, success. So I, we looked at, I looked at one of our programs that actually does set up the PDIA framework really effectively, and it, it's, it's got some sort of, it's making some really good progress. And it's, you know, it does the implementation, it does the monitoring, it does the rapid learning, and it's actually closed down a few of their projects. Uh, it's called MUVA, and, and it's in Mozambique. You can look it up. It's a really cool project. Um, but the key point about that was I asked the team, what makes it successful? And there was absolutely no agreement on what was happening in the program that made it successful. Some people thought, OK, it's, it's the fact that we build in the theory of change. Some people said, no, it's actually it's the way we've structured the team. Some people said, oh, you know, the M&E person, of course, said, no, it's the, it's the monitoring and evaluation and learning cycle. Um, and so I mean, my personal view is that we have a fantastically dynamic and enthusiastic and committed team leader, leader who's desperate to make this work. And she is just bashing people's heads together until it's acceptable to fail. Uh, which brings us sort of into the, the next conversation, yeah. so I'll, I'll pause there. But, but that's just a sort of a reflection for me. <laughs> I was going to say I'm failing totally at timekeeping on this panel, but um, that's fine. I think it's a good discussion anyway. But now, if anyone has any questions, we've got time for about three or four questions. If anyone would like to jump in now, just raise your hands, and if you can tell us your name and who you're representing today, that would be great. <coughs> yeah, uh, that was uh, really interesting. I wanted to pick up on the point um, that you made, Ben, about. Uh, partners and bringing in partners who have personal incentives not to fail. Um, uh, sorry, my name's Caitlin. Um, I work at DFAT, but I'm a, be completely open and say I'm a contractor, so I'm one of those people that has one of those incentives not to fail. Um, and I've been involved in projects which have failed fast before and watched my contract disappear into a puff of smoke. Um, do you think, um, because the environment that we work in now is very, um, dynamic between how donors operate and how implementation teams operate. Um, and there's a lot of uh, work that goes into how we structure um, implementation and contracts and all that sort of jazz. Is, is that one of the main, do you think that that's one of the main challenges, that, that incentive um, for between donors and implementers um, to maintain those um, financial relationships, which is obviously a, ch a challenge that AIDS worked with for, for a long time. Um, but do you think that this mindset is really um, coming up against that, uh, that problem, particularly for NGOs who have limited resources um, and when they get involved in these projects, they can't necessarily invest um, in, in projects that might fail as much? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to do Then I'll let you take that one. Yeah, maybe you answer that one and then the microphone can be up at the back. I think I saw another question up the back. Yeah. Um, oh, there's two up the back, yeah. So, so, I mean, I think, I think, and I suspect that the other panelists have, have views on this as well. I mean, Graham started by saying it's not just about, you know, that we've actually, the incentives, the, 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 the theology that's coming out of donors is, is not necessarily wrong. It, it, you know, it's, it's positive and it's positively encouraging this. I think it's a much more subtle issue. And it's, it's interactions at different points, right? So if you're a civil servant, your career is, is made by progressing uh, and demonstrating successful programming and showing that you can manage upwards, that you know, ministers don't get hacked off because something's gone wrong and they've, you know, they have to be dragged in front of parliament. So the incentives within the civil service, not, not what theoretically the civil servants want to do, but the incentives not necess don't necessarily support that. So it takes somebody in the civil service who's determined to make it work. I also take somebody in the supplier relationship and we're, we're going to come on to that, I think, in the, in the sort of third question. But who can have trust with the, with the donor to say, actually, look, this is not working. We need to find a way. So I don't think it's the, the structures. I'm actually looking across OPM's projects. Every single one of our adaptive programs has a completely different structure. So, and, you know, and some of them are phenomenally traditional log frame structures. So it's not that the structure is, is important. It's the people within it and the ability to manage those, those dynamics, I think. I think there's two more questions up the back and then we can move on to people. 
Hi, thanks very much. My name's Annie Major from Adam Smith International. Um, I'm really interested in this session because um, we do a lot of market systems development programs, as you know, um, and I think there are a range of players um, in the room who uh, have been applying similar principles in these, in these types of projects and others um, for, for many years. Um, so from a program perspective, I think there's been a lot of adaptation already applied um, during implementation. My question builds a little bit on the one before in terms of your views on the extent to which donors, I guess at a strategic level, are ready for and flexible to deal with um, this type of programming, particularly in um, political pressured environments um, and whether it's realistic uh, within short program timelines um, for them to, to be able to accept and, um, and support this way of programming. I think um, w in, in preparation for this panel, we had a little bit of an exchange, and none of us had ever seen a bet, a small bet that had been dropped because it was failing. And so, you know, we, we do, we have adopted the, the, the rhetoric and the language, but I think, it, as, as Ben said, at the individual level, um, but even at the, at the program level, you know, because a lot of, a lot of these pro programs, or sorry, a lot of these projects, you know, have, have people who are working on these and genuinely think if only we have another six months or if only we have, an, you know, this may get, this agenda may get some traction. So, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether we actually put some, think about performance metrics for, you know, a positive tick for the number of, uh, of, pro of, of issues that you drop, um, that you say these are dead ends, that we, we positively incentivize <coughs> Um, that, it, it, you know, amongst uh, project implementers. Um, I, I'm a little bit more, uh, but less uh, optimistic than, than you, Ben, on, on, the, on whether we've really got it right in terms of incentives. Um, I still think that in donor agencies, and this is both at, at, at DFAT and, and the World Bank and other bilaterals, that the that staff incentives, certainly in the donor, is, is still to, to um, focus on project preparation and design rather than implementation. And, you know, um, and, and, and all of this, certainly in my experience at the bank, getting something through the board, that's your, that's it, you know? Um, you move on and your success in implementation catches up, it never catches up with you because the evaluation happens like eight years later and uh, you're already, you know, <laughs> somewhere else. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think, I think uh, bilateral environments are, are more accountable, but um, in, in, in that sense, but I, but I still think that uh, it's the front, the front end of projects yeah. that, 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 uh, that the focus is on. So I'm just bearing in mind in time, I mean, we can have one more question or we can move on to people. Um, but, oh, look, all these questions, it's fabulous. We might have just one more question here, and then we'll move on, um, and there will be two more times for questions later, and it doesn't matter if we, yeah, ask questions later that are about everything, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, okay, yep, thank you. Morning. Uh, my name is Hamish Nixon. I work on decentralization and citizen participation in Papua New Guinea, and I'm one of the people that Graham can't understand why I'm unable to create programs that monitor, implement, and learn at the same time. <laughs> Excellent. I think one of the reasons why is that the, the, the problem specification that we often use to have this conversation um, is a bit of a straw man. It tends, it tends to focus on a simple kind of assessment of what we're trying to do, which is there's a donor and they would like to achieve development outcomes, and there's an implementer and they would also like to achieve development outcomes, and they're having a little bit of a tug of war about how much freedom versus how much accountability should exist. And I don't think that describes most bilateral aid relationships and projects at all, or very well. It doesn't describe multilateral ones particularly well either, and that there may be a clue in that why we see some of the success of these programs popping up in NGOs and fairly autonomous organizations. What's missing from the straw man is two or three things, probably more, but 
One is that a very big, important strand of the aid relationship that has developed over the last two decades or so is the ownership and partnership strand in which the beneficiary country, and in particular the national government and ministers of the beneficiary country, um, I wouldn't be referring to PNG at all here, are a very important part of that relationship and what they think about what you're trying to do is, is very is important. And fairly pie in the sky ideas about being adaptive and flexible may not sound the same to the beneficiary as they do to the practitioner. Secondly, those bilateral aid projects are a means of brokering uh, political and uh, conceptual relationships between national level politicians in the donor country and national level politicians in the recipient about what governance means, what gender means, what a whole, what a economic development means, and a whole set of things which aren't really determined by the same kind of criteria of what a, a development outcome is that, again, practitioners or experts might use. And the third is that the implementers and the and the donor officials are prospectors in the sense of prospect theory. And they are in the perfect definition of a situation that creates risk aversion in behavioral economics because they see very high quantifiable potential losses to when things go pear-shaped and very uncertain minimal gains when things go well. And so you would expect those people, and I think the implementers equally like a quiet life, to to behave in ways that give them a quiet life in preference over ways that are likely to turn things upside down. And those dimensions, I think, shape the, especially the institutional and organizational incentives, but some of the individual ones as well. Yeah. Thank you for that question and that series of comments. I mean, I think that actually leads quite nicely into our next session, or, you know, just talking about people and what kinds of people work most effectively in this way. You know, there's t phrases about development entrepreneurs, you know, people who can work in that context and have those conversations and have those relationships, but also cut those relationships if they need, which I think is a very hard one. Um, so yeah, is that all right if we then maybe take your comments and address them as we go for this next section, because we're really over time now. Um, cool, so now we'll move on to the next section on people and getting the team right. And maybe, uh, maybe yeah, Nicola might want to kick us off on this one and um, how yeah. you guys have been approaching that. Um, so the, the angle I wanted to bring to this, maybe I'm not the best person to go first, but I, I, from a, again, from a very practical perspective, I think others will talk about some of the characteristics that make up are needed in, in teams like this. You know, you talk about development entrepreneurs, there's all kinds of literature on this, but um, in a very practical sense, what we find is um, bring, uh, when we were having our previous discussion prior to this um, workshop, someone said, uh, very rarely we get teams, it was great, and very rarely we get the team right from the beginning, and I completely that's been very much the experience. And often, when you're, a, as a supplier, when you're preparing a bid, there's very clear criteria that you, you need to follow in order to score well against the team section. That doesn't necessarily marry with what's going to work in practice in terms of an individual, particularly at the, the team leader level or the, the senior roles. And uh, I'm quite interested here, I've seen in, 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 in DFAT context, there's been a few things that have come out recently where the team hasn't had to be on the ground from the beginning. They're recruited in inception, and I hadn't come across that before. I think that's a wonderful idea because it allows space to get the right people. Um, one of the things that we found really important is, uh, and it's actually Sabi that trialed it, but we've been experimenting with it further in other programs, competency-based recruitment. So not just recruiting on skills, technical skills or, or process skills, but also on actual competencies, behavioral things. So um, I, I know the Savvy program, they, they did a lot of work as a team. And this was actually in the middle of implementation a few years in. It wasn't from the beginning. But to really think through, if we're going to work in this adaptive way, what kind of values, what kind of behaviors? And they articulated it as a team vision mission, which flowed down into values, and then how they would live those values. And that work was then used to inform recruitment interviews, performance and management of team members, induction, you know, setting out clear expectations, and also capacity building, because a lot of people who may have come on board may have had the inherent capabilities, but just needed some you know, skills in applied PA or facilitation, whatever it might have been. And so there was all kinds of things like that. So we, we find that integrated approach to people management, the management systems was really critical in addition to trying to find the right people and, and out there. And I think another thing I would say is 
looking in unconventional places. In a recent program we had in Tanzania, DFID, our client, was like, you know, go and look in, you know, don't just advertise for people who work in development programs. And so we went out and actually in our adverts, we said, you know, you do not have to have experience in a development program. And we got some amazing people through that. We got two people on that team who are real stars. They had political antennae, they had just this entrepreneurship sort of skill, and they just translated over really easily. So those are just some of the things we're finding in practice. It's, it's not an exact science, it's difficult, but, and every program will be different, but yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely that's, ringtone. That's though. telling you to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> and so you wouldn't say that looking for these sorts of um, development entrepreneurs or the people that are getting the team right, that they're not total unicorns that don't exist, that we're not kind of trying to find a combination of skills and people who are so self-critical that they're willing to admit failure, but, you know, work well in teams, but also, I mean, for me, it's always that element of that self-reflective element that's excellent, but hard and challenging and then might make you just question everything you know if you start going down that little train of thought too much then you might just find like it's all too hard and it's all you know that kind of thing so i'm not sure if anyone do we feel like they're unicorns or we found people like that that, that really exist maybe ben or graham go ahead, go ahead again i'll just make three points on getting the teams right and i agree that it's a really challenging thing to do first point in the programs that I've been working on, it's taken us a while to get the right senior management in place. However good they are on paper before when you put your bid in, of course one A never knows that they're absolutely going to turn up, and B one never knows whether their interpersonal dynamics will work as a team. And also with the person in charge, you need a mix of a strategic vision as well as operational management, and they're sometimes difficult to get in the same person. So senior management is a continuing challenge. Second point about teams, it's interesting that we all genuinely want a greater role for nationals in our teams. They've got the relationships, they've got the networks, they understand the country in a way that outsiders never ever will. But then again, I'm going to speak bluntly when it comes to assessing the performance of contractors, my sense is that TFAT, and I don't know about TFAT at the moment, but I'm not convinced that TFAT mm. value it. They value the elegant minute with no typographical errors. And often that is not what people working in their second, third or fourth language can offer. So sometimes we've, we have had rows with our funder about our staffing portfolio, so our staffing profile, sorry. So that mix of nationals and non-nationals um, can be tricky. And then the third thing comes back to organisations, if we are going to merge the monitoring, the learning and the implementation, then you've got to make sure that you co-locate resources and responsibility. You can't separate them out. You've got to make sure people know what their responsibilities are and they've got the authority and the resources to do it. Thank you. Um, I mean, it, it sort of, it sort of fo follows on from that. Um, I, I guess I sort of, when I was thinking about teams, the, the first thing that came to mind was that none of us disagreed that the team mattered, but n none of us could really think of ex examples. There's some examples, but none of us could think, actually, there's this one way we've done it and that we really just get it right every time. It's sort of this hodgepodge. So we were sort of all in agreement that this was really important, but none of us actually could think of how, you know, how, how if you could distill it to two or three things that actually worked, there, there were, wasn't anything. So I think that's, that's a point in itself. And I guess I just, it's more of a challenge to the room. I mean, one is, especially with big uh, consultancy firms um, and, the, and the sort of su supplier contractor model, the way aid is done uh, through the, that model is it actually, does that actually work and lead to adaptive programming? So it's a, it's a big question I have. You know, should we staff, have more staff who are technically uh, internal, we, we manage them ourselves, we can make it easier to co-locate, uh, we can build teams over longer periods of time across projects because they're not all contracted for that specific project, or should, you know, or is there another way of doing it, the competency-based type of recruitment? But that leads to a challenge to the, to the donors as well. Um, 
you know, I can't think of very many technical proposals that I've written where the team hasn't been one of the most highly scored parts of the proposal. So you're building in an incentive to the supplier to find the best CV that looks the best, that ticks all the boxes, whether that person is actually going to be brilliant or not, that doesn't really matter. So I think, and I think DFAT does it a bit differently with their interview-based approach as well, but I definitely think in the DFID market that's a huge problem. And you're seeing some adaption and some change, but you know, on one side you have suppliers who have a, an incentive because of, you know, there's fund flow risk and so on, to not necessarily take on large staff costs and to build staff over a long period of time. And on the other hand, you have a donor that's not creating a strong incentive to build adaptive teams to say, actually, it doesn't matter what your team is at the beginning. We want to see your, your competency-based approach to recruitment and how that's going to work to, to bring that in. And I guess my last point, and it's going to link into the partnership thing, but it's also a challenge, I think, to all of us, is that we tend to look for technical experts. Um, and development is a very highly, you know, sort of, academic, uh, technical sort of discipline. We, we like to write about it. We like to write about political economy analysis. We like to write about thinking and working politically. Um, but I haven't seen too many development professionals who are actually great influencers. The soft skills of being a politician, of being a diplomat, aren't necessarily the same as being a good academic and being a crit you know, critical partner and a critical examiner. Um, but when we talk about adaptive programming and the sort of working closely with country governments, what we're actually talking about is having um, an agenda, saying this is actually what we're trying to achieve, and, and actually influencing and working towards it. And so maybe a silver lining in the sort of increasing alignment between foreign ministries of foreign affairs and, and development agencies is there are some skills that can be shared from the political beast into the development uh, beast. And I sort of speak of that from a little bit of personal experience because I, I had to wear both hats when I worked in Lahore. But it's just it's this sort of more challenges to the room because I think, I think we need to be more critical about ourselves when it comes to how we structure teams um, and can we actually get it right. Maybe Sarka might just bring you in here to talk about like donor ways of working and even, I guess, approaches to the program management of these types of um, ways of working. I mean, Nicola touched on the fact that this is a very hands-on very dynamic, you know, there's a lot of um, facilitation, a lot of other skills that come into program managing these types of jobs, but when we, when we bid for many of this type of work, program management is not something that DFAT might even want to pay for, you know, that might just come out of a general management fee, or, you know, it's a, but it's actually a skill, especially in this way of working, I would say, um, and helping unlock locking this, yeah, adaptive management. Um, so, yeah, I wonder if you, if you have anything to touch on about that, about donors' ways of working in this space. <laughs> you can wear any donor. Like I have. We can, <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about any donor. <laughs> Not deeper. Um, I, I, I do think, I mean, Graham, uh, Graham's point about national staff and how we, how we tap into that expertise and not put a premium on, on fully written documents, etc. I mean, that, I mean, that is, I, I, I um, agree. That. But I mean, I also think that uh, the, the expectation of one person having this you know, mix of skills is, is, is a real, um, you know, it, it, it is problematic. And I, I was really heartened to hear Nicola's comment about, about you know, recruiting people from outside development. Because in a lot of these contexts, especially um, sitting in a Ministry of Finance, you know, our classic, the classic kind of ODI fellow type profile of a young person who's n never, never uh, been um, uh, in, in uh, you know, who doesn't have vast experience um, in their home country uh, on um, a set of issues, who just goes in there, who wants to learn, who is uh, adaptable and who basically adopts the, the, the host government's kind of um, identity mm. because, because they're, they're um, technically employees of the host government. Yeah. I mean, that's the sort of, and, and who uses the soft skills leading from behind, who may not be the great technical expert, but of course knows how to draw on that technical expertise <coughs> if that's required. Mm. Um, those are the sorts of, uh, you know, those are the sorts of people
people or the sorts of uh, sets of skills that uh, we often want in these in these projects, yeah. um, but they don't often find their find their way because of uh, the points that, that that Ben made about you know mm -hmm. in order to win a bid, you need ten years experience, yeah, <laughs> at least. So um, I think yeah, I think that there's there's still quite a mismatch. Yeah. Thank you. Right, I thought we might open up for questions now. Right, shall we start on this side because I was really mean, I was favouring that side last time. Okay, so we'll start here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Sam Chittick. I'm the country representative for the Asia Foundation in the Philippines and I have the, the pleasure of working on a program called the Coalitions for Change, um, which uh, some of the people in the room here have interacted with over the years. Um, a couple of observations. One on uh, on that last point, on Ben's point. Um, I don't think that the role of um, the development practitioners in this context is the doers. Uh, I think it's really a facilitation role. Uh, and the way, so if you translate that into, into our context in the Philippines, we have at the moment 14 reform agendas that are going on under one umbrella program. It's my job and the, the job of our team to manage the structures, the reporting, uh, but we have 14 teams that are all led by, uh, by Filipinos with you know, passions and connections and networks, the basic ingredients that go into the successful reform. Um, and it's really our job to make the resources uh, and uh, the support necessary for them. And there's a, you know, there's a mentoring and a guiding role in that as well. Um, but really, if you look at you know, what goes into achieving Reform X or Reform Y, we're the minor players. They're the ones who actually lead the work and are there in the front lines every day. Um, so I guess the, rather than looking and trying to assess whether or not the development practitioners have those skills, I would say that's a, maybe the wrong question. We should be looking at how, they, how we have the skills to facilitate rather than to do. Uh, and related to that, um, Saka made the point earlier about uh, dead ends and failures and so on. I think it was a really interesting uh, discussion. Um, but I think it can be done. Saka, you were saying there's no examples that you can think of. Under the Coalitions for Change, we have seven uh, uh, investments, reforms, whatever, that didn't go anywhere. Um, there's a book that's in production at the moment, um, written by my colleagues, Hami Faustino and uh, John Seidel from, uh, from LSE. Um, and I was trying to encourage them to put in a chapter about called Dead Ends, uh, because I think that's a really useful learning process. DFAT uh, are calling it stoppability, which is a horrible word, but, uh, <laughs> but captures a really important concept, right? How do you know at what point, or how do you give up at some point and say, we've tried and we didn't get where we thought we thought we didn't get far enough. Um, and so out of that, there are, we, can, we can do case studies on seven of those where we invested time and energy and networks and, you know, us, as Ben was saying, we asked national uh, decision makers and policy makers to invest their capital and then we had to say, you know, sorry, this didn't work out. Um, but, you know, you, you can do that because you build up a relationship over time and you have, the, you have enough capital to be able to, to do that. So I think there are examples there, but it comes back to creating that architecture and the structure which gives DFAT the confidence that we're investing in the right things in the right way. Um, and we have a frank enough and open enough relationship to be able to say, look, I'm sorry, we started this last year and we haven't got any you know, far enough, or there's a real obstacle that we, we can't find a way around, so we will take the resources and move on. Sam, I think that Salka might have a question for you in return. Yep. How, how, what was the reaction um, from DFAT uh, in those, you know, with, with those seven cases? I mean, w w was, was, the, was there incentive for you to, 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 to say that, uh, to say these are going nowhere, and was the response <coughs> accepting of it? DFAT is not uh, uniform, yeah. right? So there are different perspectives within. Um, and even, you know, and, and things change as different, particularly at post, you know, as, as post offices come in and out, uh, and personalities and perspectives and backgrounds change. Um, overall, I think it's a very positive, it's been a very positive discussion, and when we raise the prospect, you know, certainly in discussions I've had, when we raise the prospect of ending something, it's never a kind of a wrap over the knuckles discussion. It's a real, oh, okay, so why? And then trying to dig into you know, what it is and, and holding us to account for, you know, have you exhausted all the avenues, have you really thought it through? Um, so I guess it comes back to having the technical uh, depth and confidence to be able to say, you know, yes, we have done all of our work, and yes, we are we're really, uh, and we haven't, <coughs> we've just blown your money, but you know, we tried, uh, we tried hard, and we have to be able to demonstrate that, and that's part of where the monitoring and evaluation comes in. 
Um, but secondly, having the relationships of trust to be able to say, frankly, you know, we've just spent $140,000 and we didn't get anywhere. Um, you know, sometimes for the level of, you know, the working level in a closed door discussion that, that works well in an open forum where we're talking about taxpayers' dollars, it's a much more difficult discussion. And certainly if you, you know, if you then amplify that. Of course, in, in the reporting, you have the opportunity to contrast that against the successes and all of the, the good stories. But um, we haven't found a way internally of telling an effective story around those failures. We're documenting for public consumption an effective story, uh, which is why I was trying to encourage the team to do a chapter on that. Um, <laughs> But I think collectively, as a, you know, as a group of people interested in these issues, we're also still not very good at that, whether it's called stoppability or whether it's called you know, wh whatever term we choose, and I hope it's a different term, um, being able to extract the lessons and present it in a positive way and saying, you know, we spent 140000 on this, didn't get anywhere, but we've extracted something from it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll take two more questions. Yeah. So as, um, as the mic moves around, I just yeah. think it's, it's important. Here. It's, it's worth sort of just saying that I mean, Coalitions of Change is actually a really interesting program. Um, you know, Innova is a very interesting program. Foster is a very interesting program. But they are still the minority of programs. I mean, Jamie is a phenomenal individual. I would argue he's a phenomenal influencer of DFAT, of, of people he works with. He's a facilitator as well. But he is good at selling his message. And I think, so when I talk about influence, I, I don't necessarily mean you shouldn't be an influ uh, a facilitator as well. But I think it's really important that we start to recognize that we have these programs that we've put up on pedestals and said they work really well. And those programs then become self-reinforcing. You can do more of, of the good stuff in those programs. But what about the rest of the programs? How do we bring those up? And, and, I, and, I, and I worry, I mean, I've listened to Jamie speak a number of times, and I'm always quite blown away by how convincing he is and how good he is at influencing DFID and influencing DFAT. And I think that's an important skill, but it's not a skill that necessarily we reflect and think you know, recognize, like managing that relationship is very, very important. Um, so it's just, I, I completely agree, and I wasn't trying to sort of say we, all, we need to be political influencers, but I also think that we need to be careful about saying coalitions of change does all of these things and we can replicate that in something else because there are, there are a lot of programs that are trying to do what coalitions of change have done and haven't had the same success. So, sorry. Okay, I think one at the back and then blue shirt. Thanks. Um, ben, you just mentioned Foster, and I was part of a learning process around Foster. And one of the things that struck us with that is what a fantastic national team they had in Nigeria. Um, you know, the program would not have had the success without such a great team. And you spend all this time putting that together, taking five years plus out of their careers with no chance for career progression or anything like you would have in a normal organization. And my understanding is after the sort of extensive learning that went on with that in the second phase, they've tried to figure out ways to bring in a much more flexible staffing structure that looks like a proper organizational, um, a place where the, the local team can grow mm -hmm. rather than just taking a big chunk of their working lives out and then leaving them with nothing at the end, in effect. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you've experienced that in other programs where there's almost been an obligation to the, to the local teams which it would not be possible to succeed without, mm -hmm. to progress. And I, I had this as a note for one of the comments about donors, but I, I think one of the challenges that I'm finding from within, from being within a bilateral agency now, is that um, most people accept that there's something to adaptive management and believe intuitively. There isn't a great evidence base, and I've got a really dear friend who talks about um, PDIA, TWP, fanboys and fangirls, and how there's a little bit of a cult around it, and how that might actually stop some of the learning across the organizations, and if there's a way where we can think about that. Yeah, shall we take a few questions now? Maybe I'll do that, because there's three. There's some very eager hands here. I've got a blue shirt here, and then another blue shirt up the back. Um, Thank and you. Then there's, and then there's one over here too. So uh, three more. Chris Stroke yeah. from La Trobe University and Development Leadership Program. Um, Danny Roderick wrote an interesting blog recently about the difference between interests and ideas. And he, and he, and he defined interests as con congealed ideas. And I'm just wondering if it, what are the congealed ideas that's, that lie behind why this is, a prop, this is difficult to do? And I'm just wondering, the principal client notions of accountability seem to be, we're stuck in those. We can't escape. 
And that then means we have a certain form of recruitment, we have a certain form of evidence that we privilege, we have a certain way of knowing that we privilege. And I guess my question really is, what are, those con what are the delegitimization of those kinds of ideas that needs to go on for this stuff to really uh, get traction? Mm -hmm. Thank you, and then I'll take, yeah, the shirt, the, sorry, yeah, glasses, and then, yeah. I'm so sorry to be so objective. <laughs> I just want to say Chris's blue shirt's nicer than mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have said vibrant pattern shirt. Yeah. Getting in first. Uh, so Mark Moran, um, University of Queensland. I, 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 just, um, I just want to draw you out. It just seems to me like we're, th this, this is a very kind of in principle conversation that's been going on for a while now. And um, we really... Um, um, are there examples that, that are starting to come out where we can do really deep engagements in implementation where some of the, um, the adaptations that have occurred and the... I mean, for me, um, with the limited work that I've done in this area, you really do exceed the outcome expectations when you um, really dive into this um, adaptive space because people are always doing a lot more. It's just not the outcome A. It's, um, I mean, they, you have to have that as the goal, but you end up doing a bit of outcome B, C, D, and E, and F. Um, and mapping that accountability story is, uh, is exciting and really empowering for the people that are in these um, adaptive implementation um, spaces, because they're often, sort of doing stuff which is under the radar and they don't feel that they can report on it because the procurement frameworks aren't interested because they're not outcome A. So, I mean, if, if you've got, are we making any progress on reforming the, um, I mean, I guess through implementation science, if you like, um, reforming these procurement um, frameworks that DFAT and other aid agencies are using so that we can really get, you know, fair income about um, building this evidence base. Thank you. Yeah, one more question. And we'll have one more question here, please, yes. And then that'll be four, and then that'll max us out, and we will answer. Hello, my name's Helen Derbyshire. I worked for the Savvy program in Nigeria, which Nicola's mentioned a couple of times, and I also work for the Savvy successor program now, which is called ECP and is part of a bigger program called Pearl. And I think it's quite instructive to compare the experience of Savvy with the experience of ECP and Pearl, particularly in relation to this idea of replicating examples of kind of good practice. So Savvy, a bit like Coalitions for Change in the Philippines, um, has had quite a kind of high profile cited as a, good, uh, as, a, as a good example of a program that's making some headway with working in adaptive ways. If I just, I'll go through a few little things that we did just to give you some sort of idea. Savvy is a demand side governance program working in 10 states of Nigeria with civil society citizens and the media trying to influence state governments. Um, it, to try and make it work in an adaptive way, uh, decision-making powers decentralized to state teams whose job was to facilitate change uh, as opposed to drive change. They, we changed our recruitment practices, as Nicola was saying during the program, to move away from technical recruitment to recruitment on the basis of soft skills. We got the frontline teams to work as a team. m and &E was part of everybody's responsibility. Quarterly review processes were opportunities to reflect and replan, as well as to report upwards. Um, we had pro a, a, a results framework was based on process-based indicators and outcome mapping, so we weren't driven by results. Um, we, re we revised our log frame 14 times during the course of the program. The, uh, there was a, a relationship of honesty and trust built up amongst the, the state team so that they could reflect where things weren't working and where they were. As our monitoring systems developed, we used our monitoring data for internal reflection purposes as well as for reporting processes and our central technical team acted as a buffer. So they dealt with the sort of diffid and the, and the supplier demands, leaving the state teams free to deal with what was going on on the ground. So we had quite a good model, and I think DFID recognized that model, and in the, sec and in the, in the, the, uh, pr the, the successor program, uh, learning adaptation, being politically smart, locally led, is absolutely built into the design, which was not built into the design of Savvy. 
And in the successor program, we have exactly the same team. We have the same technical management team. We have the same advisors. We have many of the same frontline staff. We're yoked in that new program to a supply side uh, governance program. Um, and the program as a whole is, is quite high profile in DFID, more high profile than Savvy was. It's got a bigger budget. It's DFID's biggest investment in governance reform uh, globally. And various things are making that a far more constrained environment to work with. So even though we've got the team, we've got the skills, we've got the model, we've got the credibility, we're really struggling to work in an adaptive way in this new program. Partly because we're working with a program that's used to working in a more top-down way and is struggling to adapt its systems. Partly because we've got a higher political profile. Partly because we're linked to a supply-side program which then gets influenced by the relationship between the British government and the Nigerian government, which then overrides decision-making, and partly because the, the whole environment in DFID, and I think this is also true in DFAT, is becoming increasingly constrained. So the space we had during savvy days, where we could have process-based indicators, where we could reiterate our log frame, that's changing. We've got much more demands for, for specifying outcomes, which constrains the space of our frontline teams. We, the atmosphere in DFID is much more risk averse. So I just, I'm just saying that even for us who are experienced, we are struggling with doing this in this current environment. Mm, very, very interesting. Okay, thank you for all these questions. I think we'll start with um, Heather's question on fanboys and fangirls around TWP and um, <laughs> PDIA, maybe Graham can, can take that. <laughs> and then we can move on to whether we have other examples at OPM of ways we've staffed these programs, a bit like Foster potentially, yeah. Looking at the evidence base, I think, I think all of us would argue that the hallmark of adaptive management is flexibility, and flexibility is in two parts, and that is responsiveness and adaptation. In the programs that I work on and the others I've looked at, I actually think that there is an evidence base for responsiveness. And I think there's a significant body of evidence that shows that if programs are set up in the, at the outset to be, to be responsive, responsive to the change of part of the government, then they can meet that function. Where I am less optimistic is in adaptation. And what I understand adaptation to be is a change in the sequencing, the mix, the timing, the, the, the activities that are designed to reach some sort of development outcome as one implements. I've seen much less evidence that teams are alert enough to be able to know in real time when to change, let alone whether to test the donor to see whether resources can be shifted in the way that we would like. So I think there is an evidence based by responsiveness Adaptation, I'm less convinced about. In terms of Chris and Mark's questions, I'll answer them together if I may, or at least my interpretation of the answer. Um, Chris, you asked what should be delegitimized. And Mark, you were saying, what is it that um, we're accountable for? I think the answer is the same to both questions. I think that implementers, whoever they are, need to be less accountable and we need to delegitimize in adaptive programming the outcome level and we need to be far more accountable for three things the quality of our selection at the beginning that phrase drips off the tongue we need to do things that are technically feasible no, technically desirable and politically feasible. Much of our selection remains focused on what is technically desirable. I've not seen much evidence that formally, at the project selection stage, there's an explicit consideration of what we judge to be politically feasible. So I think that's one area where people like me and APT and probably OPM and Palladium we need to be accountable for the activities that we choose. That's what we should be accountable for. 
Secondly, we need to be much more accountable for the quality of our analysis of why we think a particular course of action will lead to a bunch of outcomes. And there's a big difference between the theory of action and the theory of change, which we won't go into. But we need to understand why we think doing A, B, and C will lead to X, Y, and Z. What's our theory of change? Why do we believe the interests for the change will overcome the interests against us? We need to be accountable for that. And I think too, we need to be much more accountable for our decision-taking as we move through the implementation cycle and give us much less accountability for the delivery of the outcome. Thank you. And then does anyone want to answer Mark Moran's question around um, accountability frameworks and procurement frameworks within some of the donors potentially DFAT and whether they feel like they're responding and changing to some of the elements that we've all spoken about here today? Was that, yeah, I think I got your question right, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Mark. I mean, I, I can, I can, I mean, I can pick it up, but from a from a sort of putting on my my different hat from a few years ago, I I think, I think there's just an inherent tension, and I, I was talking to the the UK's cabinet office recently, and we were having this fascinating conversation. It wasn't about development, and and they were saying, well, one of the biggest things that we do as the as the implementation unit in the cabinet office is we we try to get the legal guys and the and the policy guys to sit down and, and actually have a conversation when they're trying to change the way they, they deliver something the you know the the implementation science because often what happens is you have a series of policy decisions that are you know about adaptiveness and you have a series of procurement decisions that are not related to that at all and I think the UK is actually quite a good example of, of where that sits right now, is that there's been a big rollout over the last 10 years of a new procurement framework across the UK government. It's just starting to hit DFID. And it's complete, I think it's, it's quite significantly at odds with the wider language within DFID. And I mean, from a personal perspective, I saw that tension on the ground in, in Pakistan. You know, you've got a series of procurement rules. This is how we want to deliver it. This is how we need to deliver it based upon the European rules uh, and, and guidance on, on procurement. And as development practitioners, this is how we want to deliver it, because this is what we know will deliver the, most, the greatest effect. And, and there are some people, I think, and I suspect you know, the big programs, Foster is a good example, Foster One and, and Sadi. If you think about the environment in Nigeria, I, I don't think actually DFID's become too much more results focused than it was when Foster was kicked off. I think that you just had a higher tolerance of risk appetite in, in Nigeria in the head of office at the time who was actually quite skilled at managing the dark arts of that procurement tension and that sort of like internal bureaucratic tension and the policy development tension. And I think we need to be really upfront about that. So when I talk about influencing skills, I don't necessarily just mean them in terms of, you know, we should hire development practitioners um, you know, for our programs who can influence national governments. I actually mean we need the influencing skills in development practitioners within our own organizations the people who can play the dark arts and who can figure out how to you know, massage a minister at the same time as getting a, a high-risk development program through. I mean, I think it's amazing to this day that Foster, which is this massive oil and gas program, super high risk, um, you know, really high profile in, in Nigeria in the terms of if it, you know, we, we separate. We don't, the Foster team doesn't believe that they work for OPM, they believe they work for Foster. And there's no OPM branding on Foster because it's so political, the oil sector, oil revenue management, that it's just not talked about. And I think it's, it's really important to recognize that, that, that managing all of those tensions and, and figuring out how to do it is, is, a, is, is the dark arts of, of being a good bureaucrat. And actually, how many development professionals get into DFID or other organizations because they want to be a really good civil servant and manage all the fun white hole politics that you know, <laughs> everyone loves dealing with the Ministry of Defense, right? Um, so I think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's something we need to acknowledge that to make these programs work, it's actually, it's a, it's a coalition of a lot of people across a lot of different parts of the, the sort of development cycle. Um, yeah, and I so. think that brings us nicely to our third session, which we obviously don't have a huge amount of time for, but we're still going to touch on it anyway, which is getting that relationship right between the donor and the contractor, building these relationships of trust so that we have the, you know, the right people who can have these difficult conversations that, you know, that Sam was talking about. 
I mean, Heather, just re relating to Foster, I know that the Foster team in Nigeria, they apparently have a weekly or sometimes even a daily phone call from the DFID office to find out what's going on and know when it's appropriate for DFID to step in and when it's appropriate for them not to be at the table. And I think that is, you know, I mean, Saku's touched on this, but it's a different way of, of donors working. It's not just the design of that program, it's being in the nitty gritty of the implementation, but also knowing when to be part of that and when to step back. And that requires a real level of trust. And so, yeah, now just ask the panelists all to touch on that, on how they think this can be achieved or examples where it has or hasn't. Yeah. Maybe. Go for it. Some, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, again, uh, trust is, is, is earned. Um, and I think and it's a two ways, obviously, a, a two way street. I think um, here, and this has been much talked about in, in, um, in, in other fora. Um, I think, you know, DFAT as, 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 a, as a, um, the donor has to set the high level strategic direction of, of these, uh, of these um, programs and then trust the expertise of the implementer. Um, but, it, but that's much, much easier said um, uh, than, than done in one instance of one of your um, facilities, Graham. Um, I saw a, a, nor a sea change when your team leader arrived, and then finally there was a, a breath. Okay, wow, there's a development professional who has extensive comparative um, knowledge of this field, and, um, and 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 you could see the high com kind of you know letting it go and 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 trusting the day to day, get, releasing, <coughs> getting rid of the micromanaging because they felt that they were, you know, this was, this was someone they could trust. Um, at the same time, you know, there's been much discussion internally about, about the skill sets within DFAT and development capability and building that up again um, in, in a way that, uh, that is able to provide sufficient strategic direction to the, to the contractors because um, you know, this is obviously um, a partnership, um, and, and we're all trying to, you know, the, the North Star is, is our, the development outcome, but also doing something, you know, working positively together to that development outcome, and we can't, we, we simply can't do that without, um, you know, kind of a, a little bit of role clarity about what this way of working entails, and, and the appropriate skill set within the donor and the contractor. Yeah, I would, I would agree completely with all those points. I mean, the trust has to be earned, and we've had similar examples of, you know, a, a, a donor getting very involved because they didn't potentially trust the team we had in place, and then when we replaced particular team leaders for someone who they did, you could just see the relationship shifting. So I agree with that very much. I've seen that several times. Um, I think it's interesting to me that it, it touches on a point a few people have made a lot of the programs at the minute which, where we're actually making a lot of progress are smaller, or small to medium size, a little bit under the radar. I mean, it's what Helen was saying there about the experience in Nigeria. The current program, Pearl, as a big, um, as a large program, really high profile. And, you know, the risk appetite has just shifted because of all kinds of factors. So some of the programs where we're doing some quite innovative work, the, 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 the advisors within um, DFID, they've got a bit of capital, they've got a license to let us do that. They've almost built the case internally uh, and they're, they're, they've created the space for the program because they want the learning out of it, you know, what works, what doesn't. In a bigger program, I, and also to be fair, they're very clear that we do have to achieve results. So they're allowing us a little bit of um, leeway to test, to model through all these sorts of things. But actually, if we're not coming up with some sort of results, that's going to be a problem. And this is where the, the kind of shared risk and the accountability comes in. Not so common here in, in, um, in, in this context, but payment by results is a, is a thing that we're, we're really struggling to, in the UK context, to, 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 to balance with adaptive programming and some of the sort of shared risk type models we have are things like, um, you know, not defining outcomes up front, but having, say, a basket of outcomes that potentially could happen, and out of those, if there's 10 op, you know, potential ones, if we can get two of them, that's where we have hit, you know, the mark. Or another one is where, you know, we, we, we put some, you know, payment by results on an outcome at the very end of the program, but what that actually is is not going to be defined until about a year or a year and a half before that stage. So, 
there's various things that we can do to build accountability, to build trust and so on, but um, yeah, that relationship is key. And, and where it works well, it, it does have an effect on the program, and, and where it doesn't, it, again, it can hold the program back. Yeah. I think I'd add only one thing to that. If we are going to change the, the nature of the relationship between the contractor, the implementer, and the donor, from one of the principal agents of partnership, then trust is absolutely necessary. But as uh, Saku and Nicola have said, it's got to be earned. In, um, in my experience over the last couple of years, the issue has largely been around basically the staff makeup on both sides. My organisation was establishing programme design and management teams from scratch. Many were employed directly from leaving jobs with TFAT. So they brought those skills and competencies mainly around delivery. So from the word go, we did not have that sort of ability to implement, monitor and learn to get them simultaneously. And TFAT were going through their own change management program where their staff <coughs> probably wanted to continue doing what they always wanted to do. So as well as not having that sort of high-level trust, not having an agreement that we're accountable for high-level outcomes and the flexibility to have adaptive space to, to, uh, to manage it, what we thought, we thought best. We were very much responding to the needs of the funder. And it's absolutely understandable in the context of those three particular programs. One has now been going for four years, one has been going for two, and another has been going for two and a half. And in one particular instance, the degree of transformation in ways of working and the trust relationship is remarkable. In another one, we're halfway down the process, and the third, we're probably a third of the way down, and the responsibility is recognised on both sides, on both sides, um, but that's very much a work in progress. <laughs> I might just bring you in here, Ben, because I know that you've worked for DFID and for OPM on the same project in Pakistan, so you've actually <laughs> seen both sides up close. Yes, well, I don't actually work on, on the project in Pakistan, I should just clarify that, because okay. that would be a bit of a conflict of interest. Um, I, I, I actually just wanted to... So we, we sort of all agreeing that, you know, obviously partnership really matters, and so I don't think I need to sort of say anything more on that. I think the, the two points that I wanted to make, and it links to sort of my experience being a political uh, representative in, in Lahore working on this big subnational governance program, but also representing the UK's national interest, um, is, is that a lot of this conversation has focused on our relationship as development practitioners with the countries and the, the places and the projects that we work on. But I think we need to recognize, and it comes out in some of the comments, that a lot of our, the, the, con the people who are contracting us are not necessarily always development practitioners, but they, they have a massive political economy of their own to manage, and, and not all of them are always that skilled at doing it. Um, you know. But I think, I think it's really important that we, we recognize that the world has changed a bit you know, UK national interest uh, in, in the DFID market is not going to go away. Uh, obviously, with the merger of AusAid uh, with DFAT, you know, that's become something that's at the forefront. So I think my big lesson in, in Pakistan was, well, how do you bring the two together? How do you deploy the political savvy of the high commissioner to help move a program forward, to help unblock something, when your local team says, no, actually, this is an issue where having the High Commissioner say this would make you look better internationally potentially would be a good thing for the Chief Minister to hear. Um, how do you use that, that sort of more dynamic, more complex relationship to try to actually have more of an impact, to think and work more politically, to build the soft skills, but also to make sure that your team's starting to understand what the constraints to the donor are? So one of my frustrations when I was in the donor uh, world is the lack of understanding from the consultancy team about what my constraints are. What, are. what are the deadlines and the pressures that I'm under? And I think that's just as important as recognizing from the donor side what are the constraints that the supplier is under that we're putting a supplier under. 
Um, and if we're going to build strong partnerships, the recognition of those types of constraints is, is as important as you know, whatever we do to build the shared log frame and so on, because we have to, everyone has to feed a beast of some for, form. You know? Maybe in academia, but even in academia, you, you, you have to feed sort of the publication beast, right? So everyone's always feeding a machine and is working to a set of incentives. And, and the challenge for us as development practitioners is to maximize to minimize the, 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 the perverse and negative incentives and to maximize the positive incentives to build strong partnerships. And that takes, that takes really skilled individuals, but it, it also takes a huge amount of effort and a focus on things that we often don't see as, as the primary, of primary value. They're not going to be the things that, you know, in, in the um, uh, coalitions for change, sort of building those relationships aren't necessarily the immediate things that you think those are going to deliver the development impact, but those are the things that enable the delivery of development impact longer term. So maybe that's sort of the point on partnership that I would just end on. Mm, thank you. Okay, I think we have like maybe time for two questions. Depends how short the questions are. Maybe try and keep them short and we can try and get through a bit more. Um, yeah, we'll have one here, please. Thank you. And then here and here. Three questions, but please try and keep them short because I've run over. Sorry. Hi, um, my name is Minwa Voon from Oxfam. Um, we're now in a phase of experimenting with our ways of working internally and externally at Oxfam. And as part of that, we're working quite closely with various design, tech and innovation companies. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn and then I think there's also a lot they can learn from us. And we've already kind of come up against some limitations where, okay, we work in quite different worlds. In your experience, like, have you seen from like with this, these ideas of failing fast and testing and pivoting, have you, I'd be interested to hear from you what you think we can learn from the private sector outside of the development world, and maybe what are the limitations like where we're just gonna butt up against a wall? Cool. Does someone wanna start answering that while we get another question, while the microphone goes over? Or you um, well, so it's it? interesting, DFID's doing a lot of thinking, built, trying to build in agile management um, and, and this MOVA program is one example where they talk about sprints and so on. So um, I think there is thinking, but more could be done. Okay, your question. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Osborne. I'm a research fellow at the Lowy Institute and development economist. So I'd like the panel just to um, put into their minds the environment we face here in Australia um, and to think the question I ask about um, and, and, and to, to, to think about your answer in terms of Papua New Guinea, Pacific Island nations. Um, ben, you're making some wonderful points about work in other jurisdictions which are really useful. Um, but the environment we face here is um, very complex and the thinking and working politically issue and adaptive, man um, adaptive programming is, um, is something that, that is very difficult in this environment. So it does, to, to have adaptive programming and, and thinking and working politically, it requires a high degree of capacity both on all sides, um, both in the donor and in the um, implementing partners. Now, listening to Penny, Senator Wong yesterday, um, I have concerns about uh, DFAT's, um, or she certainly raised some concerns about DFAT's capacity um, to, lever, to, to deliver or to manage such a complex um, uh, agenda which you've laid out today. Um, so what I'm interested in is what is the realistic approach in the environment that we actually face here? And listening to Graham talk about the work of Abd Associates in P&G, um, it's a very complex and difficult environment in, in where uh, thinking and working politically is occurring every day in the PNG government. Um, but are we thinking and working politically in the environment we face with DFAT as, as, as um, development professionals? Thank you. I think I'll hold it there and I might, Seb, I might say, everyone should go along to Seb's talk. What time's your talk? 3 p.m. and it's also on adaptive management, isn't it? Yeah, we've got a talk this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe for those interested, we can continue some of this conversation later because we're just going to run out of time now. But yeah, there's a plug. And now we can answer those last two questions. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, David. I think that most of our staff in the office in Port Moresby think and work politically all the time in certain dimensions. My bottom line is that 
to thinking politically is not translated into working politically explicitly in terms of our programming. I think our staff know full well the pressures that the Papua New Guinea government are under, and they know full well the strategic importance of PNG to Australia. They know full well the pressures that the High Commission staff are under. So in that sense, they think and work and breathe and live politically. But we are not talking about that. We are talking about the extent to which an understanding of events, dear boy, events, what happens on the ground. We are talking about the extent to which what happens on the ground, the extent to which we can deliver our development objectives are every day, every week, affected by stuff that happens and the extent to which they really respond appropriately. We're not talking about people thinking about, oh, the High Commission have got to deliver this report to Canberra. They do that all the time. We are talking about the impact on programming. And that's where I think there's a big gap. Just quickly on um, responding to David, um, I think there is uh, some, of the, some of the concerns or issues that Senator Wong raised yesterday. I think there is an acknowledgement, um, and the pendulum is swinging back to, an, uh, and there's an acknowledgement that the development capabilities um, in, in the integrated department are not what they, what they were um, for five, five years ago um, under Jose, that, and, and, and I, I think there is, there is quite a, a strong push um, to, to put a re-emphasis in the workforce planning. Um, I mean, in, in the broader bureaucratic environment, I think development is returning um, in, in, in that sense. Um, I take your points about a lot of the lessons, and this is one of the concerns in, that, that Ben raised earlier, about um, the coalitions for change, replicability. You know, when we're dealing with high capacity environments like the Philippines mm -hmm. and, and Nigeria, um, and, and looking at programs like that and the lessons like uh, fr from those programs and talking about the Pacific, um, it is just such a different world um, and, and that the, the social, political, economic forces and human capital um, issues simply because of scale, um, I, they're, they're so fundamentally different. So I, I, I um, take your point and it's for further discussion. Um, the afternoon's uh, panel. Does anyone have anything desperate they'd like to finish off with? Or, yeah, because I know there's the three minute aid pitch happening now, so we've got to vacate the room or let others in. We'll have the best seats. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just want to, um, to add to what Saka just said in response to Sam's point about coalitions for change and the extent to which something like coalitions for change under INA's fantastic leadership, the European in Myanmar, a very different context, very different context, with a very, very different team leader, who plays it very, very different to INA, but with equally successful results. So we shouldn't just say, oh, well, coalitions for change is led by such an individual that it'll never be repl replicated. That's not the case. Okay, we've run out of time, but thank you. If everyone could please join me in thanking our panellists. Thank you. Thank you very much.